So thank you very much for having me. My name is Hazel Goods and I'm a Journals Commission Lead at Emeralds Publishing, so based in the UK. Um, so my role at Emeralds is to look after a portfolio of journals. I look after tourism and hospitality journals and public policy and the economics journals as well. So today I'm just going to talk with you about how to get published, um, a bit of information about how Emerald works and things like open access publishing and how we approach that. And then we'll talk about journals. So I work with journals day to day, so I very much focus this presentation on journals. But if you have any questions about other formats like books, for example, feel free to ask because I have experience working in those formats as well. Okay, so. First of all, I just want to give you a bit of background then on how Emerald just started and what we do. So we were founded by academics at the University of Bradford Management School in 1967. So we're very much founded by academics for academics. And Emerald is very much focused on real world impact. So we want the research that we publish to make a difference in the real world. That's what we're all about. So we're very much focused on the sustainable development goals. And what we've done with the goals is we've split them into four separate areas, which are healthier lives, a fairer society, responsible management and quality education for all. And so within all of, all of those areas encompass the goals or some of the goals within those areas, we're really working hard to publish as much research as possible and to promote that research as widely as possible so that we can help to make sure it has the biggest impact that it can have. And Emerald is also the very first publisher to sign the San Francisco Declaration uh, on Research Assessment, so DORA. And that's all about new ways of measuring impact. So we use those traditional metrics that we all talk about lots within publishing and within academia, such as the impact factor. But we're also looking at new ways to measure the impact of research. So for example, things like alt metrics, which show us where research has been cited in policy documents, for example. So we're just trying to widen um, the way that we measure the impact of research. And so we publish the more traditional formats, such as journals, books, and case studies, alongside newer formats. So we publish 350 journals and around 250 books a year. And we also publish case studies within our cases journal. So those are the more traditional formats for publication, but we have started to publish newer formats as well. So policy briefs is one of those. Policy briefs are all about trying, us trying to engage with the policymaker community and trying to bring ac academia and the policymaker community together to bridge the gap between research and impact. So they are all about translating research from those more traditional journal article formats into a policy brief, into a format that policymaker can use in order to make a difference. And then we're publishing podcasts and blogs and videos as well. So that's all about bringing research to as wide an audience as possible and just trying to make it as accessible as we can do. So if you have any questions about any of these formats, do let me know because I'll be happy to answer them. Sorry, my slides don't seem to be moving, which isn't very good. No, my slides seem to be, seem to have stopped. Matt, can you see my slides still? We, we can see the uh, the one with the journals, the books, the case studies. We can't see, but yeah. it's not moving. Maybe it you should- move forward for me. <laughs> I'll try, and, um, I'll try and pause the share and then we- Yeah, can... stop the sharing and, and try it again. Can you see my? Now we can see it, but we see it. Yeah, now it's we're back. Yeah, it's moved. Yes, moved. It's moved. <laughs> Excellent. Not sure what happened there. So sorry <laughs> about that. Um, so we also publish open access research. Um, so I'll just go through some of the ways in which you can publish open access with us at Emerald. Um, so we have what's called green open access, which is a self archiving form of access. And that's about publishing your article within an Emerald journal but at the same time taking the author accepted manuscript and depositing, depositing that into your institutional repository or not for, 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 not for profit repository. So maybe related to your subject area at the same time. Um, so you can share a version of the article more freely. And then we also have gold open access. 
and that relates to most of our journals. So we do have some open access journals which are fully open access, fully gold open access, and most of our other journals are hybrid journals. So within those journals, you can publish open access, but you can also publish in a more traditional way so that research is only available to those who have a subscription to the journal. So that would be a university library, for example. So within the gold open access um, journals, an article process and charge is made for the publication. So you do have to pay this APC, it's called, um, in order to publish gold open access. And then we have platinum open access as well. So that's, um, that relates to a portfolio of journals that we have where we publish the journals on behalf of societies and institutions. And those societies and institutions have usually founded the journals and they own the journals. Because they are funding the journals, you can publish open access in those with no charge at all. So you don't have to pay the article process and charge. Uh, so that's definitely worth keeping in mind. And then we also have waivers and discounts as well. So depending on the economic status of your country, there may be waivers and discounts available. So if you feel that like your country might be one of those that that would um, have um, that would be applicable to, then do check the website because there's a list of countries on there. Uh, we also have what are called transformative agreements, which a lot of publishers have now with particular countries for open access. So the way that these agreements work is that we have an agreement with the country. And then if you're from a particular institution at that country, you can publish open access with us in any of our gold open access journals, absolutely free of charge. So for example, we have agreements with Sweden, with Italy, with Ireland, uh, with Austria, with lots and lots of countries. If you're from Lund University, for example, in Sweden, then you can publish open access with us free in any of our journals. And you, there's an unlimited amount of papers that you can, you can do that with. So it's definitely worth just checking the website and finding out whether your institution is involved in any of these agreements with the publisher. And I think it's worth thinking about open access because your paper will receive more downloads and citations. We know that through publishing open access, but also it's about bringing your research to the widest possible audience and just making it as accessible as you possibly can do. And you also get to then share your research more widely as well. So it's a really great opportunity if you're looking to ex expand the audience of your research. Let's see if the slide moves. It does, <laughs> that's good. Um, so another way that we can publish uh, open access at Emerald is on our Emerald Open Research platform. So this is a fully open access platform. One of the really interesting things about this platform is that the peer review is completely open. So when we're publishing research papers on the platform, we publish them immediately and then they are reviewed in a very transparent way so everybody all of us, everyone in the world can see the reviewers' names and the reviewers' comments. And then the authors can make a response to those reviews and even upload an amended paper. So the transparent peer review is a real um, sort of game changer, I guess, for the way that research is published. And this platform is structured around the sustainable development goals rather than by a particular subject area. So it's very much author-led. There isn't an editor acting as a gatekeeper for the platform. So you'll, um, as an author, you'll be able to upload anything that you feel the community would benefit from. So we can upload things like policy briefs, data sets, slides, even posters from a conference or anything like that. So all of those um, article types, all of those types of content, I guess, can be uploaded. We do charge an, an article processing uh, there is an article process in charge for research papers but again if you're from one of those institutions you will usually find that it can be waived and um, every other form of content the policy briefs the data sets the slides and posters can be published for free so that's another uh, platform worth thinking about when you're thinking about publication and that can be especially useful if you're struggling to find a journal which fits with your research. If it's very, very interdisciplinary, sometimes that can be a challenge. So a platform like this can be quite useful. So that's a bit of a whistle stop through, tour through what Emerald does. So now I'm just going to talk about journals and I'll just start by showing you quickly the tourism and hospitality journals that we publish at Emerald. So we have consumer behavior in tourism and hospitality, which 
recently changed its name. So this is a new name for the journal. I've written down the old name because it's so long. Um, it was the International Journal of Culture, Tourism and Hospitality Research. So it's a bit of a mouthful. Um, so we've changed the name, we've changed the aims and scope slightly as well. So consumer behaviour and tourism and hospitality is um, definitely shorter and um, definitely fits more with what the journal is publishing. So that's the new um, name for this year. And then we've got a journal on events and festival management as well. We have the International Journal of Tourism Cities and the Journal of Hospitality and Tourism Technology. We've got the Journal of Hospitality and Tourism Insights. And then we've got Worldwide Hospitality and Tourism Themes, which is very much practitioner and policy focused, works in a little bit of a different way to the way that well, most standard journals have worked. So that one's a little bit different. And then we've got Tourism Review and the International Journal of Contemporary Hospitality Management. So there's a lot, there are a lot of journals there that you can sort of pick from, and there's always something I think for every single aspect of tourism and hospitality um, research. So hopefully you'll be able to find a home for your research there. So I just want to talk about uh, research papers now. Um, and what makes a good paper. And I'll, I'll be sharing my slides afterwards, so I won't you know, go through every single thing in, in detail. And probably a lot of these things are things that you already know. Um, but of course, originality um, is something that we're looking for. Um, how relevant is the paper to the current scholarship and does it extend that existing scholarship as well? We need a strong research methodology and we're looking for a sound logical argument too. Theoretical and practical implications um, are something that we particularly are interested in at Emerald. We have a structured abstract. So in that abstract, we ask authors to detail how they think um, you know, their research, what, what the implications they think their research has for, um, for, the, for the world. Uh, so that's definitely worth thinking about closely. Now that references need to be recent and relevant. Internationality. Um, is something we're thinking about as well. So we do publish articles on, um, you know, lots of different regions of the world, and some articles, um, you know, do focus on a very, very um, localized part of the world. But it's always worth putting that research into context on a on a larger scale. And then a strong title and keywords are really important, and they really help with the discoverability of your paper. So we ask our authors to pick five or six keywords. Um, when they submit a paper, and it's always worth thinking really closely about those. What are the kind of things that people will be searching for that will help them to find your article? So that's key in the way that people are accessing articles nowadays. In the old days, when people would receive a printed copy of a journal issue, then you know your paper would be in there. But now people are searching online, so it's worth thinking about how they might search in order to find your paper. A well-written abstract is, of course key as well that's um you know the first thing that readers will see so it's got to be really clear and concise and then finally the way it's written clarity structure and writing are obviously um key things to think about but once you've got your paper ready selecting the right journal is really important so first thing i would suggest doing is checking the aims and scope of the journal it sounds really obvious but You'd be surprised at the number of papers which journals actually reject because they don't fit with the aims and scope. So they just get rejected immediately. Um, so do check the aims and scope of a journal and make sure that your paper is a good fit for it. If you're not really sure, then it's definitely worth contacting the editor and just asking them if they feel that your paper would fit. You could send them the abstract um, and get them to take a quick look and they'll be able to give you advice. And if they don't feel that it fits their journal, they might be able to suggest another journal as well. So do feel free to contact them. And another thing to consider is the readership of the journal. Who is it aimed at? Perhaps it's a journal which is more aimed at practitioners rather than researchers. So those kinds of things are worth thinking about. Um, and the time from submission to publication is of course really important. You want to know how quickly your journal is going to your article is going to take to move through the journal publication process. So if you would like that information, then again, you can contact the editor and they'll be able to confirm that for you. 
And I would also have a look at the recent articles that the journal has been publishing just to see how your paper fits with those as well. And then it's always worth checking that the paper, the journal accepts your paper. So most journals will accept research papers, but they won't all accept case studies or viewpoints or practitioner papers. So if you've got something a little bit unusual, it's definitely worth checking that as well. Check whether open access is an option for the journal. Um, if open access is important to you, then it's definitely worth checking out those options. Quality is, of course, something that we're all looking for in journals. And again, you know, the metrics such as the impact factor, the site score are really important here. And the newer metrics as well, such as alt metrics. So, um, you know, you might um, if you look at papers on Emerald Insight, where we um, publish all of our research papers, um, you'll see that they all have the, what's called the altmetric donut. It's just a little logo that's shaped like a donut that sits next to all of the papers and it tells you when you hover over it how the paper has been used in, in an alternative way. So how many times it was cited in the policy document or who's been talking about it in the media, that sort of thing. So I'd have a look at that, but I wouldn't discount those papers that don't have, you know, the really high impact factors either I mean I know that obviously you know you've got your institutional um you know stipulations on on where to publish but um you know if looking at some of those smaller journals which don't yet have impact factors some of them work really well with the communities that they're in and they do um manage to pull in some really big name authors um so you know they're publishing really good quality papers so it's always worth just having a look at what the journal has published in the past. And then I would check with colleagues as well and ask them what, what do they recommend? Where have they had a positive experience? Are there any other editors who you know, were great to work with? That sort of thing. And uh, hopefully they can make some recommendations. And then once you've found a journal to publish in, it's really important to polish your work before publication, just to help ensure that it moves through that process smoothly. You don't get too many, um, you know, criticisms from reviewers. Perhaps you know, um, making sure that the um, it fits with the author guidelines for the journal. It doesn't get rejected on on the basis that it doesn't. So looking for things like grammar, spelling, and punctuation when you're proofreading, typos, making sure your statistics are accurate that references are complete, that it reads well, and maybe ask somebody else to have a read through and you know, to have a fresh pair of eyes on, on the paper and see, see if it reads well to them as well. And now to make sure that your reference in style matches the journal guidelines. So we use Harvard, Harvard at Emerald, and we've got lots of guidelines on our website, which go into great detail about how to use our reference in style. But do make sure that your reference is not matches whatever the journal is asking for, because you don't want the paper to be desk projected on that basis. So once you have submitted to a paper, sorry, once you've submitted to a journal, you're uh, in the peer review workflow uh, stage. So this is the sort of behind the scenes, if you like, of journal publishing. So you would submit your manuscript to the journal. And then the next stage is that the publisher checks each element of the manuscript to make sure everything is present and that it's all okay. And then the editor would make their evaluation. So this is the first stage of the workflow. And this is called the desk review stage. So the editor will have a look at each manuscript that comes in and they'll make an initial decision. And that will either to lead to reject a paper because it doesn't fit perhaps with the end and scope of the journal or to send a paper out for review. So if they reject the paper, they'll give you that feedback on why it was rejected and then you've got the opportunity to resubmit. And if they send it out for review, then they're looking for at least two reviewers um, who will then um, send their independent reviews back to the editor. Usually, um, the desk review stage takes at least a couple of weeks, depending on the volume of papers that the editor has to deal with. Um, and finding reviewers can take a couple of weeks as well, just depending on reviewer availability. So at different times of year as well, you know, it's more difficult to find reviewers sometimes. Um, in the pandemic, for example, we noticed that some people were, were reviewing very, very quickly in March 2020. 
some were taken a lot longer because they had to deal with new things due to the pandemic. So reviewer availability is really important here. Um, so usually a review process will take about six to eight weeks, just depending on those reviewers. And we operate the double blind peer review process at Emerald. So the reviewers don't know the author names and the authors don't know the reviewers names. So that's how that works. And then once the reviews are back in, the editor will then make another decision on the paper and they'll have to decide whether to accept the paper, to reject it, ask for it to be revised or to send it back for an additional review, which they might do if the reviewers, for example, really disagree on the paper. They might ask for another review um, from somebody else. Um, they would accept the paper if the reviews came back and said that it should be accepted. Um, perhaps the reviews would recommend that it should be rejected, in which case it would be rejected. And then revision time, you know, is, is allowed for any authors who have been asked to make either a major or a minor revision for their, to their paper. So you would be given the details of how big that revision was and exactly what the editor thought you should revise. And then you'd have the time to make those changes and then to resubmit to the journal. And in some cases, if it's a very, very small revision, the editor might even just check that for you after you resubmit. But if it's a major revision, it's likely that the editor will send it back to the same reviewers and ask them to, um, to check it again. So once you've gone through the stages of the workflow and your paper has been accepted, you're then advised of that decision. You're given the opportunity to revise your paper if you want to before you go through to the production stage. And that's where your manuscript is copy edited and proofed. So you would receive proofs of your paper that you can check before publication. Although at that stage, we would try to make sure that any corrections are kept to a minimum. So it's better if you have big corrections to make those prior to that stage. And then the article is published. And for us at Emerald, we publish on an early site basis, which a lot of publishers do nowadays, and they, they all have different names for the early site process, as we call it. But basically, it means that rather than waiting for your article to be compiled into an issue or a volume um, of the journal, you your article is published immediately. So we publish within 32 days, as long as the author can meet the deadlines that we set for checking proofs. Um, and your article is published on early site, receives a DOI, and it can be cited in the same way that any article can usually be, but you just have to wait for it to be put into the issue and then into the volume. So this whole process usually takes around three to four months from submission to making the final decision on the paper. Again, depending on the volume of papers that the editor is dealing with, the reviewer availability and the reviewer response time. So that's the peer review workflow. So just to go into a bit more detail, if you receive a revision request um, as your outcome of the peer review workflow, that's really good news because you're still in the publishing cycle and almost every published paper is revised at least once. So the next thing to do are to acknowledge and thank the editor and to have a read through of the comments. And if you disagree with them, do explain why to the editor and have that discussion with them and ask them about anything that you're not sure of, and then consult with your co-authors, and maybe even your colleagues as well, if you'd like to ask somebody else to cast their eye over it. And then you'll receive a revision deadline for sending in the revised paper. But sometimes you won't be able to meet that, and that's fine. So if you just let the editor know, as soon as you know that you won't be able to meet that deadline, we can, we can make an extension for you. That's not a problem. And then when you send your paper in, just attach a cover and email, just explaining how the revision request has been made. That will really help the editor to know what you've changed and it will just help speed up the process. If your paper is rejected, don't give up because this happens to everybody. And there are lots and lots of reasons that papers are rejected. So maybe it's something as simple as the paper just doesn't meet the author guidelines. And in that case, you know, it's just a case of going back and finding out how and then making those changes before resubmitting. Sometimes papers are out of scope for the journals, so that's why it's really important to read the aims and scope before submitting. Um, sometimes, you know, those might not be that clear. So again, check with the editor and, and, um, and find that out before submitting. And then sometimes it could be something like there being issues of quality, 
um, such as an inappropriate methodology being used, or maybe the editor doesn't feel that the paper makes a sufficient contribution to the field. But you'll receive all of that feedback and all of the review of feedback. So do have a look at that and try to improve it before resubmitting. And I would encourage you to talk with the editors. There are some really, really fantastic editors that I work with who are really happy to talk with authors about their papers and to help them to improve them and to give that feedback. And I've seen lots of editors take that almost like a mentoring role with people who are very new to publishing and sort of helping them to, to understand everything and to, to make those changes. So do talk to the editors um, and that will be really helpful if, if you're new to the process. So I just quickly wanted to talk about promoting your work, which is always a good thing to do. Um, before publication, it's really important to build your online presence and try and expand your network that way. So maybe think about creating a website or blog, getting active on things like LinkedIn and Twitter. I would always suggest as well volunteering as a reviewer because you get to see lots of papers before they're published. And not only is that actually a bit of a privilege, but you get to see what works and what doesn't. So you become more critical, I think, as a reviewer. So that can really help you in writing your own papers. And it just helps you as well to get to know the process of how journals work too. And then do register for an ORCID ID if you don't already have one because you'll need one in order to submit your paper to an Emerald journal. And then after publication, uh, it's all about informing your networks of the paper that's been published. So lots of people add the information to their email signature. Maybe you do some promotion on social media, on listservs, uh, contact those who you've cited. And then finally, let your institutional press office know and they'll be able to do some promotional work as well. The publisher will also do promotional work around the journal. Uh, maybe picking out particular articles, you might be asked um, so if, at, at Emerald, because we're very focused on those sustainable development goals, we quite often will ask authors who've written papers for us whether they're interested in a, in a video, making a video of that paper, or maybe turning this into a policy brief. So you'll probably get opportunities like that as well. So I definitely suggest taking those. Um, and that's it from me. So thank you very much for listening and I hope that was useful. And if you have any questions about any part of the publishing process or anything to do with journals or any other formats, I'd be really happy to help. So I'll stop sharing now. See you thank way. you, Hazel. Very <laughs> interesting. And we uh, open up the floor for questions. Stefania. Oh, hi, hi everyone. Mine want, wanted to be a clap because of all oh, right. Okay, sorry. It might have an been appreciation. A clap. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's good as well. Thanks. <laughs> Ray, please. Yeah. Well, I'll ask that silly question we were talking about, Hazel. <laughs> um, in fact, you put it up on your. Um, I think on the reject. If things were rejected, or whether or not you were checking about the journal, and you said within the scope of the journal, if a paper was good, but not within the scope of the journal, would you recommend that it went to another journal or would it be up to the author to do that? Sometimes editors will do that. So sometimes we um, we run what's called a, a cascade process. So there are quite a lot of journals at Emerald, which are quite are linked to a lot of other journals that run on similar subject areas or themes. So sometimes there'll be a cascading process whereby if a paper isn't quite right for that journal, the editor will be able to automatically recommend another journal. Or if there isn't a formal process like that in place, an editor might just say, actually, have you thought about this other journal? I think the paper would work really well. And yeah, I mean, you will get those recommendations or even you know, ask for them. If, you, if you're not getting them from the editor automatically, it might be worth just going back to you and saying, is there any other journal that you'd recommend? And uh, another thing that you could do is contact the publisher or commission editor at Emerald. So all of our details are on the website next to um, the journals. And, you know, if you, for example, have a paper and you're not sure which journal it fits, you can contact me and I will be able to help direct you to the right journal. Thank you. Great. Could I just follow on that? Because this morning I was doing the exactly this process. I was looking through various journals to see 
And I was looking at the aims and the scopes, but I found them very generic. I found them, I, I couldn't really, not for Emerald specifically, but from, from various. And so, but, but you, you said that basically there's a lot of effort going into the aims and scopes. So they should be, I should as an author be able to follow them when I decide, but because I couldn't really see any difference between them. it was like more or less the same. Yeah, I think um, a lot of aims and scope for journals are a bit difficult to read sometimes, I think. And I think one of our roles, you know, as a publisher is to try and make them clearer and easier to understand. And that's something that I certainly try and do um, for my journals. Um, it's difficult if they all look very similar. I think probably looking at the content that they're publishing is, is the best thing to do in that case and just have a look at what, what other articles they're publishing, what are the special issues that they've got calls for papers for. Um, and then that should hopefully give you an idea of the kinds of papers that they're accepting. Mm -hmm. um, but no, I appreciate it. it's very difficult if they're all very similar. Mm -hmm. <laughs> quite annoying really <laughs> and I was really doing my homework but I wasn't very successful but there you go I'm, I'm learning at least I was trying to do the right thing uh, <laughs> thanks very much Hester. we have a, a question in the chat if you if you if you want to open up the chat Somewhere weird. yeah I think um if you have a paper like this uh, so shall, shall I read the question out it's probably the best thing to yeah do. yeah that's, that's good um idea. can you give some advice for authors who wish to submit a conceptual paper recommendations for design methodology and implications I would say not all journals will accept these papers so it's definitely worth checking before submitting again there are so many papers which are rejected from journals because um you know, they, they don't fit with what the journals are actually accepting. So definitely do check that first because it saves you so much time. Um, I think for a paper like this, um, I don't think I have any particular advice from a sort of um, paper sort of structure kind of way. I guess, um, you know, you're the experts in that more than I am. Um, as a publisher, I, you know, I don't have um, the experience of having written one of those papers, but um, I would say if you have any particular concerns, maybe to talk to the editor of the journal. Um, so it might be that some some journals actually ask you for for implications, for example. They they put a lot more emphasis on that than other journals do. So our journal, Worldwide Hospitality and Tourism Themes, does that particularly. So that's very much a practitioner-focused, policy-focused journal, and everything that's published in that journal has a really clear sense you really get a clear sense of what the implications of that research are um so that's that's specifically laid out in a particular format for that journal so there are definitely journals i think which are sort of more suited to that kind of research and where if you're really if you're really really keen on trying to promote that those sort of implications of your paper then you'll find that those journals are really good homes for research so i definitely have a look more closely at the the sort of um at those journals and try and see if there's anything that you think anywhere that you think might be a really good home for your paper but i think um you know if you want particular advice on the paper construction it's definitely worth talking to the editors and you'll find that a surprising number of editors are really, really keen to sort of really mentor, especially early career researchers, and sort of help you to publish your papers and to, to make them the best that they can be. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Thanks, Asa. We have another one in the chat from Christy. Yeah, it says, in the case of desk rejection, what to do if you disagree, if you disagree with the editor's opinion? Does it make sense to reply to the editor in this case and how to handle the situation? Yeah, I imagine there are lots of authors actually who do disagree with, with the with opinions of the editors and the reviewers. I think in that case, you know, do have that discussion with the editors and you do go back to them and just let them know why you feel um, you know, the decision um, might is something that you don't agree with. And and um, you know, you can always ask ask them for more details. Um, sometimes you might receive a rejection and perhaps the, you know, the reasoning is quite short and you want a bit more information. Don't be afraid to go back and say to the editor, could I have a bit more information about this? Could we have a discussion about it? I'd really like to try and understand what it is I need to change in order to, um, in order to get the paper through. I think um, there's a lot of 
um, we were saying earlier, actually, just before this session, that um, publishing is a very mysterious process, I think, unless you're very much involved in it. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really easy, isn't it, to kind of, um, it's almost a bit scary to sort of go back to the editor and say, well, actually, I don't agree with this. But editors are, are all human and they're very lovely people. I've worked with lots of them over the years. So they are really willing to chat to authors. And I think they really appreciate that kind of engagement as well. So do talk to them. Um, and do have that discussion with them and I think you know it's better to do that rather than to worry and to think about you know keep thinking about what what might be wrong with the paper and sometimes you'll find that it's just a case of you know perhaps you know the reviewers had a particular opinion and the editors have gone with that and perhaps you you think the reviewers have missed something else and um, so do go back to them and talk to them about it. Thanks Hazel. There's another one in the chat. Mm. Yeah, it says any discussion, any suggestions for discussion part? So do you mean the discussion part of your paper? Um, I think, well, for me again, it's quite difficult for me to answer these questions in a way because <laughs> I work on that on the other side of things, so I'm not actually writing your paper. But again, I think if you are looking for particular advice on um on writing a part of your paper, again, I would talk to the editor about it. And I do think it's worth doing that or perhaps having a chat with other colleagues as well who um, you know, know your subject area much better than I do. Um, I think um, you know, from a publisher's perspective, we just want things to be um, as thorough as possible, but also really, really clear. So I think for us, it's all about making sure that people can access your research and can understand it. So I guess from our perspective, you know, if it's well written and, um, you know, you've included um, everything that you feel is important, but in a way that can be really understood. I think sometimes papers do suffer from, um, you know, just not being clear enough. And I think sometimes that that means that they fall down at the review process because reviewers don't fully understand them. So I think, you know, just try to make things as clear as possible um, and uh, yeah, make sure it's well written. Maybe ask somebody else, another colleague to have a look at it and, uh, and have a read of it for you. Um, and then we've got another one as yeah. well. Do you think it's possible to introduce the methodology and main actions works of a territorial approach based thesis in a Congress and then try to publish the last results of it. I feel like um, that, that might not be a question that, um, that that I can answer that well either. I think um, I think I should probably have asked one of our editors to join me on this <laughs> on this book. Um, let me just read that again then. I think Liz, are you are you there, Liz? I know you've got your picture up. Because Liz, you are you're always on about this, aren't you? About conference papers and publishing afterwards. Are you there? I think she's gone. I mean, I think from our perspective with conference papers, a lot of papers that are published in journals did start out as conference papers. And I think, you know, if, if your paper did start out like that, it's absolutely fine to, to submit it to a journal. And we do sometimes find as well that we're publishing special issues from conferences where, um, you know, the, the conference has agreed to publish the special issue with us. And we're taking the papers that have been submitted at the conference and we're publishing the best papers in the special issue. What usually happens though is that they're submitted to the conference and then all of the feedback that you receive in those sessions is then incorporated into the paper before it's submitted to the journal. Um, so that's, um, that's the way that it usually works. Um, so I think that would be, be my answer on that one. Sorry, Sorry, Ray, I couldn't get my microphone. Uh, <laughs> we thought off. you'd split, thought we can you split off for a cup of tea somewhere. <laughs> no, no, I hadn't. <laughs> no, um, I, I just asked you because I know that you're always quite hot in terms of um, conference papers. Well, and... the, the problem is when people publish conference papers, if they put them in the public domain, then technically they can't be republished. If they go on a USB and they're just distributed to the conference delegates, that's okay. But you can't double publish. And this is a, an issue which uh, I fought with for many years because people wanted to publish in the proceedings and then they wanted more recognition 
for the same paper, which sometimes was substantially changed. Um, I've just been reviewing some papers and they're very short, they're for iCRE. Now, if people publish those uh, two, two and a half thousand words, if people publish those and put them in the public domain, they can't republish them. But it seems a shame because they could be developed in a much better way and published in a journal. Yeah, I think we do find that some conferences um, do ask authors to assign the copyright of their paper to the conference. And if you are if you have done that, then you can't publish it in a journal um, because you've, you've signed over that copyright. So it's definitely worth keeping an eye on whether you've done that when you've submitted to the conference. I think, you know, that's why we do ask that papers are, um, you know, amended after you receive that. The, um, that feedback from the conference, it does have to be substantially different in order to publish it in a journal. I think that's absolutely right. Um, but, you know, we, we do publish papers that did start out as conference papers and that, that's how they've developed over time. But it is worth keeping that copyright issue in mind, that's for sure. Great, right. please. Yeah, a question. Um, this is from the point of view of actually looking or reviewing some papers is that uh, sometimes you're reviewing papers and they've got a very well I say they're supposed to be international but in fact they're not they're very nationally focused mm -hmm. and I just wondered how whether or not that is acceptable for the journals or whether or not you want them more on a sort of a bigger scope if you like rather than focusing on a school or an institution or, or a very narrow piece of research in terms of a nationality or a country? No, I think for us, you know, it's fine if they look at a particular local area. For example, we have the General Tourism City and they have a couple of special issues coming up for next year. So there'll be one on Latin American cities and one on Chinese cities. And it's absolutely fine that those papers focus on that smaller regional area. I think for us, you know, it's worth put in the, the research into context. And I think that that especially applies actually to, to book um, chapters or to, to, to books, if you're wanting to propose a book, um, you know, putting that research into the global context is really important in those cases. And if you can do that, then as much as possible, then that's great. But we do, we do see those, those more regional papers and there are lots and lots of journals, I think, which also, a very regional anyway in focus so that that is their focus is you know those smaller regional areas and and so that's fine I mean I was I was working on um a journal which was just um based on South African research and you know all of the papers are, are related to South African um region regionalities then they're, they're not based on anywhere else and that, that's absolutely fine so um it probably depends on the journal mm. Oh, you're frozen. Yeah. Those local papers, but I haven't come across them yet. <laughs> you froze there for a second, but you're back now, so it's good. <laughs> Thanks anyway. Okay. Uh, oh, did I? Where did, yeah. did I? No, that was just, uh, just very, very <laughs> shortly. So. Only a second. Now we have another question in the chat as well. Ah, yes. So what about translating a paper or book chapter into another language? Is this an acceptable practice to translate it as it is and make another publication in a different language? I think if you've already published um, your book chapter or your paper um, and you've assigned the copyright for the pub for publishing it into a publisher, then you would need to talk to them about translating it into another language and then publishing it again. So all publishers have people who work um, on translations um, and can help guide you through that process. Um, but yeah, you would need to speak to them because you've likely assigned the copyright for that over to them. Thanks. I had this problem as a reviewer. I was sent a paper to review and I found it in another language when I was checking through and uh, it was actually rejected immediately. Yeah, that's really interesting, isn't it? I think um, perhaps some authors just aren't aware that, that, that that's how the copyright works. But quite often, if you speak to the publisher, you know that sometimes they'll 
um, so I'd be happy to work with the other publisher and maybe you know allow them the rights to publish in that in that other language. Um, but uh, yeah, it's um, not something you can do without the publisher, unfortunately. Mm -hmm.